technology, but there's just something about the Bible. This is a Bible. Uh, you know, th what we carry around on our side, that might be the cellular phone, and we got many connections with that, but I have never thought of my phone as being the holy phone, right? Come on now. And uh, so if I've challenged you to bring your Bible with you, and I believe that uh, we're going to turn to the book of Exodus chapter number 1 this morning. Exodus chapter number 1 in your Bibles. Thankful for the presence of God that I have felt already in this house. Thankful for those of you that may be watching online this morning or hereafter for your faithful following of the ministry here. We just pray that something we can do will be a blessing. That's the whole reason why we do what we do. It is not to show out, it's not for showboating of what we are and who we are and what we've done here at Gray Street, but it is for the Lord's glory. Amen. Isn't that the way it should be? For the glory of God. I know that many of you this morning have been taxed by the enemy, tried by the enemy, furnace of affliction. Some of you have been through the threshing floor recently. But with the Lord's help, I pray that God will help me to speak directly to what you've been going through through this message. Exodus chapter number 1, verse number 6. And if you have it, if you will, stand to your feet this morning. The Bible says here, Exodus chapter number 1 and verse number 6. I don't know about you, but I feel a sober atmosphere this morning. I don't know if you feel that, but I do. The Lord has something to say to somebody here today. I just feel it. Exodus chapter 1, verse 6, if you have it, say amen. And Joseph died, and all his brethren, and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when they are falleth, or they, there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Verse 11, Therefore they did set them over, or did set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasured cities, Python and Ramses. Verse number 12, Those of you that are following along, I want to pause here because I want this verse. I want this verse right here. I want it to just settle down into your spirit. Verse number 12. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. Read that again. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage. Has anyone here this morning felt like you've been made to feel bitter with hard circumstances? But they did this in mortar and in brick. In all manner of service in the field, all their service, wherein they made them serve, was with rigor. And the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives, which the name of the one was Shepra, the name of the other was Pua. And he said, When you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill him. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. With the Lord's help this morning on this beautiful Sunday, we're going to preach with the Lord's help on the other side of affliction. Raise your hand to the Lord this morning and pray for God's perfect will 
Lord God, this morning we're humbled at the very idea that we have your word this morning to elaborate on, to be able to declare the very precepts of your will and your word. We're asking you to take the word of God and apply it to our heart. Let it become the, the salve and the balm that we need for this era of day and time. God, for every circumstance, for every situation, for every trouble, for every vexation of the Spirit, I pray, God, that you'll come against with the blood of Jesus Christ. Lord, that you will set it not. Every spirit that would rise up against the very nature and the very power of God, cast it down right now in the mighty name of Jesus and every child of God can say, Amen this morning in the presence of the Lord. When I was just a small child, I can, rem I can recall or remember that I had a strange fascination with fire ants. Not because I like to be stung by them, but I had a fascination with the way that they did things. I grew up for many years in a place called Howie in the Hills. Anybody know where that's at? I spent a few years in Howie in the Hills. My, my parents, they moved out into an orange grove. And uh, there wasn't but like two or three houses there. And the only one that was still able to be lived in was the one we lived in. The other ones were just run-down houses that were uh, shacks, if you will. We lived in the middle of an orange grove. And I found out quickly, I got acquainted as a small boy with fire ants. I won't tell you what my dad called them, but he had a name for them things. And I tell you one thing, they would sting you, and I mean set you on fire. Those are some of the most vicious insects I have ever met in my life. But my little fascination and curiosity would cause me to do strange things. Sometimes I would, Sister Nora, I, those were some of the biggest fire ant mounds that I've ever in my life seen in that orange grove. Of course, when you're younger and you're a small child, everything looks bigger, even Snickers bars, but that's a whole other story. But as a small boy, I'd take my foot, Brother Coon, I'd go to those ant piles and I'd kick the top off of it. Boy, I'm telling you, you'd see ants just scurrying and going crazy and I'd stand back as a little boy, mischievous as you don't know what. And I mean, I could have been my, my heir of times, Dennis the Menace, you know what I mean? But I kick the top off and I'd watch them fire ants boy they'd come out of there in droves man it just the ground would turn a certain color you could tell they were not happy about what had just taken place but as a young boy there were things that I would do uh, to those young those little ant piles I mean we were bored I didn't have Xbox or PlayStation we found stuff to do I'd go out in the orange grove with my BB gun and shoot everything that was moving and whatever wasn't moving shoot the windows out of the house next door but I took a garden hose I tried to flood the mound out. I'd stick a garden hose down inside the mound and watch ants bubble up out of the top of the... Uh, some of y'all thinking, boy, he was bad. Yes, I was. I was terrible. And I got stung plenty of times. But my fascination with those ants, I learned something about those ants. Begin to watch how they operated. And, uh, you know, the, I, we didn't have a lot of money. I grew up in a time when we were about as broke as you could be. We didn't have a lot of money at all. And I had kids in school that their parents, they'd go buy them these little ant kits, little ant farms. You know what I mean? They spent however much money. Well, my ant farm was me going to the refrigerator and getting a glass mayonnaise jar with a top on it and scooping it down into the big, the uh, middle of that ant colony. How many's ever done anything like that before? And I mean, and uh, I, this is uh, off the subject, but I I made money off of this now. I took these things to school and put them in. Uh, I mean to tell you, I was an entrepreneur at just a young age. I, I took that glass jar and I dipped it down in the middle of that ant pile and I'd get as many. Boy, the, the more white that I saw and the more eggs I saw, boy, that was a prize piece, you know. And I had this one boy in school, his name was Mark Bass. And some of you, he was like my best friend. And Mark's parents, they were wealthy parents. And so Mark would pay sometimes $10 and $15 for a jar of ants. And one time we took those the jar of ants to school. And I remember I was in fifth grade and they evacuated the whole fifth grade pod to Varys Elementary there. And the reason was because Mark had dropped a jar of fire ants and fire ants were everywhere. And so they had to call an exterminator. And somebody say he was bad. He was, I don't mean bad to the bone. I was bad. I was a bad child. 
But I learned something about those ants. The more that you came against them, the more that you tried to knock their nest down or tried to destroy their mound or their colony, it just seemed like to me the more you did that, the harder they came back and the more they would build. And if, if that mound was 15 inches tall and you knocked the top off that mound, let me tell you, within a few days you'd come back and that mound would be bigger than it was before you knocked it down. Somebody say we could learn something from those ants right there. But you see, I began to understand that if I've learned anything from these places of my life, that the position of affliction is where we, where we would find the Israelites. And these are people that have at least two different options in their life. You can allow your affliction to, be, to cause you to be uh, depressed. Have you, have you ever had something come against you and it made you feel depressed? They, they, they had the option of being depressed about what they were going through. Or there was this other option within them that often takes place within us is when we get come against by something and we get aggravated about our circumstance and it makes us more determined and we come out with the boxing gloves on with a determination that says, you are not going to take me out of this fight. Years ago, I remember I've uh, I preached about this on a different occasion, but sometimes things will happen in a church service or a sermon or an illustration, and this happened to be a skit. And I remember being in a church service where that the pastor's wife had uh, orchestrated a skit, and what she did was she had different people sit around the table as if they were sitting in the kitchen or dining room at the kitchen table. And you had mom and dad and the and the children sitting around the table and during the midst of that skit they began to argue amongst themselves but there was a reason why that they started arguing there was this black draped thing that looked like the devil if you will illustrated as the enemy Satan and he walked into that, that kitchen setting and he come over to where they were all sitting down and there was no place at the table for the devil but the devil kept badgering one of them. I, I want to say it was the mom until finally the mom got up and allowed the devil to sit in her place. Well, after a few minutes, they began to fuss and fight and bicker. And, and, and it just like the, the demon spirits began to take over at the kitchen table. But, if, but eventually, that mom stood back and began to survey what was going on. And a frustration mounted within her. And you could see the complexion on her face as it began to change. She began to get aggravated about what the enemy was doing to her family and at the kitchen table. And finally she began to declare back to that spirit from hell. She said, this is my family and you cannot have them. It's time for you to leave. This is my marriage and you can't have it. It's time for you to leave. This is my children and you can't have their minds. It's time for you to leave. You see, you can get depressed over everything you're going through or you can let a spirit rise up with the Holy Ghost Spirit rise up within you and you begin to say you know what I'm sick and tired of what you've been doing to me I'm sick and tired of what you've been doing to my family to my mind to my finances to my automobiles I, I'm tired of what you've been doing to my children I'm tired of what you've been doing within this marriage because all we ever do is fight anymore let me tell somebody this morning you can either get depressed over what you're going through or you can do like the children of Israel and you begin to realize what's going on and get frustrated about it and say enough is enough. Can somebody say that this morning? Enough is enough. And so when we enter into this a particular text, I want you to notice something that some of you may not realize. You've heard the name or the, the, this, this title, the book of Exodus, anybody? And so the book of Exodus, some of you may not realize uh, that the very word Exodus, uh, it means a mass departing uh, or a departure of a great deal of people. And so when you read the, the book of Exodus, you understand uh, that from the beginning of Exodus all the way to the end of the book of Exodus, it is a summary of everything that took place during their captivity leading up to their, their deliverance from God. You see, I will get ahead of myself a little bit here by reminding this congregation, but there's a portion of the word of God that I'll quote the text later, God will, but there's a portion of the word of God where the Lord 
Lord, he, he began to move in such a way because of the cry of the people. The Bible said by reason of their affliction that the Lord heard their cry and he began to deliver them. Is there a mother sitting here this morning that if your child is in the other room and they're crying in excruciating pain that you wouldn't get up and go to the other room and see what you could do to try and quiet that baby, try to comfort that anybody this morning. Is there anybody that would not do that? Let me tell you, I believe that that's what began to happen with God. God began to see the affliction of his people. But as we enter into the text, one of the things that I want us to notice is that Joseph has just died. There is an entire generation of people that has passed away. You see, there is a relevance in the fact that Joseph has died because Joseph was a link between the Egyptians and the Israelites while they were in bondage. Joseph was a mediator of sorts. Joseph was one that stood in the gap and made up the hedge. He's the one that kept a peace about all that went on between the Egyptian slave owners and the Israelite slaves. He made sure that there was a peace between them and resolved whatever issues might arise. But now the Bible tells us that there's a brand new generation that has arisen and Joseph has died. All of his, his uh, those around his age have that whole generation. They've died. And in the process of all of these things dying, the mediator they want had between them and, and the Egyptian people is gone. But now the Bible says a new king rises up. A new king is crowned. And this new king has no relationship with the children of Israel quite like they may have had in days gone by. He doesn't understand Joseph. This new king doesn't even care about who Joseph is. But there's one thing that begins to take place. This new king begins to survey the scene. The populace of the generation that is before him. As he begins to look across the land, he notices that he's got a problem on his hands. These people, these Israelite Hebrew people, they have outnumbered the Egyptian people. And he begins to concern himself with the idea, what am I going to do? They have outnumbered us, and if a war ever breaks out in the land of Egypt, what if they side with our enemy? We're going to be toast. We're going to be gone. They're going to take us over. We're going to be overtaken and smitten by the very people, the slaves that we own. So he made a decision within himself to do at least one of two different things. The first strategy that he decides that he's going to do. He's going to remind these people that he is in charge. You know, sometimes uh, even in a prison system, they say if you want to keep uh, a peace within a prison system, you may have control and you may have power but there is a certain level of control and power within a prison system that if you try to exercise too much power over those people they will cause a revolt and they will cause great problems within a prison system so you've got to exercise wisdom with your power but that's not what he decided to do he decided to let them know we just want to remind all you Israelite people we realize you may outnumber us but we want you to know who's boss around here. We want you to know who's in charge around here. Do you know right now that the devil wants to make you think uh, that he's the one in charge? Uh, you're looking around and it seems like he is the one that's calling the shots. But does anybody say, I know you're not the one in charge. Everything that you do's got to pass through the blood. Everything you do's got to go by the desk of God. Somebody say, God help us this morning. But he took away their liberty. They had set taskmasters over them. He you know, when you began to set taskmasters over people, whatever liberty they had, they knew they were slaves. They knew they belonged to the Egyptians. But now they've got taskmasters. They've got people that are watching their every move. They're, they've got people that every time they begin to work, and if they get tired and slack off, they're going to crack the whip on them and say, get moving, man. Let me tell you, that created an animosity between the Egyptians and the Israelite people. They intensified 
intensified the caliber of labor that they made them work by. They made them work with brick and mortar. They made them work with field service. They put them in the hardest positions. They made us made them deal with the hardest level of labor. And the Bible tells us that they took the Egyptians' burdens and placed them on the Israelites. Now if you read the text, you'll read right over it if you're not careful. But the Bible said that they gave them their burdens. In other words, if there was a hard labor job, if it was washing dishes around the house, they made them do all the dishes. If it was doing laundry, they made all them do the the laundry. If there was a fence that needed to be built, they got to build the fence. They sat back while every one of those Egyptians or Israelites had to work like dogs. And let me tell you, the Bible also told us that they were made to serve with rigor. Let me tell you something, that word rigor comes from the Hebrew word therek, which means to break apart, to fracture with severity and with cruelty. There are some of you, the devil's tried to break apart and sub- come on now, feel the Holy Ghost and suffer with severe cruelty. It seemed like my emotions and the things that I hear running through my head. Do you know the devil will fight your mind with cruelty? You'll have cruel thoughts running through your mind. Cruel ideas, people being cruel with what they say about you and to your face. Can somebody say, God help us all this morning? But they were made to serve with rigor. So the king begins a massive building project where the Israelites would be the labor to build treasured or elaborate cities. Uh, Underneath this new king, uh, he has ventured out to build these elaborate cities. Uh, Amen. Cities that are decorative. uh, Cities that will be remembered for years uh, um, after. And so in the process, uh, he's made it up in his mind. Uh, We've got slaves uh, and we're going to use them. We're going to work them like dogs. If they die of dehydration, well, we'll just move on to the next slave. We're, because they're outnumbering us anyway. We'll work them till they drop in the field. We'll work them till they drop outside. We'll work them till they die of a heat stroke. We'll work them. We'll do whatever we have to to snuff out these people because they did not care about God's people. But somebody say God cared about So that king mounts a massive building project. And the level of these people's burden of cruelty caused their lives to be what the Bible calls bitter. Can you say that with me? Bitter. Say it one more time, bitter. Because some of you have become bitter. Your life has made you bitter. Your life feels bitter. Your circumstances feel bitter. Your your anguish inside. You don't understand why that you're going through what you're going through. And it makes you feel bitter. Has anybody ever been there and honest to admit that this morning? But the second thing that the king decides he's going to do, he's going to reduce the size of their population. I'm going to work them to death and I'm going to reduce the size of their population. He's trying to reduce their influence. Do you know right now, if the devil can sidetrack you and hijack your testimony, he will reduce your potential to be able to influence your children. He'll Come on now, some I feel the Holy Ghost. He will reduce your potential to influence the people you work with. He'll make you so mad that you do something that ruins your testimony. He'll make you so mad that everything you preached about will make no sense to anyone around you. But somebody say, hang on, honey, because God's still in the background. God's still ready to move if we'll give it over to God. Can you say amen? But he goes to the Israelites. And these two leading Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua, and tells them that when Israelite women are in the birthing position and the baby comes forth, you analyze that child. And if that baby is a male child, then I want you to I want you to kill that baby. In other words, uh, when your feet are up in the stirrups uh, and uh, the baby comes forth, you're hoping that it might be a female because otherwise these Egyptians uh, may have your child slaughtered. But you see, the cruel part about it is that he goes, this king goes to their own people. My God, this is getting bigger and bigger. Thank you, Holy Ghost. He goes to their own people. Did you, somebody, I want you to get that. He goes to their own people. He goes to the Hebrew midwives. If the devil can't get you one way, he'll work for your own people. 
If he can't get you to pick up a meth pipe or a crack pipe, if he can't get you to lay in the bed of homosexuality, if he can't get you to have an affair, he'll come for your own people. He'll try to use your own people to hurt you. Come on, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. He'll try to use those close to you, those that are in the most intimate room, the birthing place, those that are so near to the life expectancy that's about to come forth. He's going to try to use them to destroy you. My God, help us this morning. She's got her feet in the stirrups. The baby comes forth. Fully dilated, here comes the child. And whenever the Hebrew midwives look down, they've been given the command, kill that child if it's a boy. If it's a female, you can let it live. But we're going to get rid of these Hebrews one way or another. But the plan backfired. Why, Pastor Myers, why did the plan backfire? You know why? Because when the baby came forth, those Hebrew midwives, they looked down at the innocence of a child. My God, if America, America could get back to the place of understanding the innocence of these little childs that America is killing by the thousands. But conviction got a hold of those Hebrew midwives' hearts. And Sister Patricia... They look down into those beautiful little eyes, beautiful little skin tone, that little baby that came out of that womb, and they said, we can't do it. So all the while, the king thinks he's got a plan in place. But let me tell you something. I've got a king that's got a greater plan in place than what the devil's... Somebody say, God, help us all. What he failed to realize is that his strategy would create a brand new problem in all of Egypt. It was like he reached up and swatted a hornet's nest. Have you ever done that before? Have you ever reached up with a stick? Have you ever thought to yourself, well, I'll get that thing, and you reached up and swatted it, and lo and behold, you got bit instead? You got attacked? Do you know that whenever... The, you see, here's the thing that some of you need to understand about this whole entire story. These Israelite people are somewhat adjusted and adapted to their current situation and circumstances. They are somewhat used to going through what they are going through. And so they become comfortable where they are. They got used to being slaves. But you see, the enemy messed up. Because the enemy stirred something inside of them and they were no longer comfortable being a slave. I would to God that a sinner who's been comfortable in their sin and the devil gets and pushes you just a little bit too far. Come on now. And he stirs something inside of you and no longer comfortable with being an addict. You're no longer comfortable living in adultery. No longer comfortable living in sin. But something takes place and you get stirred up and say, I can't go on like this. I'm tired of living like this. And so Pastor Myers began to see as I read this story, what began to unfold before all of our eyes is they afflicted these people and the Bible says they afflicted them with mortar. They afflicted them with brick. They afflicted them by hard work in the fields. And what you need to understand is that the more they began to afflict them, something is happening. Something's taking place in their life. You see, they put their burdens on the Israelites. So now long, they're no longer out in the yard digging their own holes. The Israelites are doing it. They're no longer working from daylight to dusk. The Israelites are doing it. And all the while, they're getting biceps. They're getting triceps. They're getting, come on somebody, they're getting a six-pack. And I ain't talking about Michelob. All the while, oh, I feel the Holy Ghost. They're developing an endurance and a tenacity and a resilience because God said there's going to come a time that I'm going to take you out of there. 
And you're going to need the endurance to outrun Pharaoh's. You're going to need an endurance to withstand the times where all you got is water from a rock and some manna that you've never seen before. You're going to need to get used to living off of not much at all because I'm going to take you through a place and before I can get you to Canaan, I've got to get you strong in the Lord. That's all right. The devil's dumb enough. He don't know what he's doing because all the while you're being afflicted. The Bible said the more they were afflicted, the more they multiplied, the more they grew. They didn't just multiply honey they got stronger their midwives got stronger the women got stronger the children got stronger let me tell you when you take a trek of deliverance and a mass exodus out of a land you better be fit you better be strong you better be ready let me tell you mamas and daddies you wonder why that hell is assailed against your marriage why that hell is assailed against your testimony why that hell is assailed against your mind it could be that God's going to take you to Canaan but before he can get you to Canaan you got to be strong enough that when you get there that you won't quit, that you won't leave God, that you won't abandon ship, that you won't go AWOL, that you'll make up your mind and say, God, I'm going to fight this battle. It doesn't matter what I face because I know the whole time I'm getting stronger. Can somebody say thank God? That Egyptian king, Sister Jackson, lived to see the other side of affliction. I have seen before with my own eyes, people that were afflicted and came out stronger on the other side. It wasn't but a few years, or maybe, I'd say within this past year, maybe the previous year, I've lost track of time, but I had a young couple come to me. There was infidelity in their marriage. We met and had a a little session, of, I guess, talking with the Lord and with each other in the prayer room of the church. And as we sat down, I began to explain to them. I said, sometimes the very thing that you look at as the potential to destroy you or your marriage is the very thing that's going to strengthen and make you stronger than you were before. You cannot see that right now. How many of you know that when you're in the midst of it, all you can see is the junk? When you're laying in the hospital bed, all you can see is the tubes and the, and the heart monitor and all the stuff they attach to you. And you feel the pains and you see the stitches and you see the scars and you see another round of medicine coming through the door. You don't see beyond that room. You cannot see yourself walking out the front door on a Monday morning years later looking up to the sun and the sky and the stars and just saying, thank God that I made it out. You can't see yourself there a lot of times because all you can see is what you're going through at the very moment can somebody say amen to me this morning uh, you see I watch that a lot of times there's at least three different things that I see people do uh, most people that I've watched in the church uh, number one they let go of hope and they adapt to the process I've watched people say well I guess I'm just going to have to get used to it it's always going to be like this uh, he's always going to beat me we're always going to have problems uh, I'm always going to be a failure I'm always going to be job to job uh, I'm always going to be broke. I'm always. Uh, I've watched people, they'll get rid or, or give up on hope uh, and adapt to the process. Uh, I've watched the second thing that people do. They give up and refuse to go on. Uh, they just sit down, fold their hands and say, I quit. I refuse to go on. Uh, many of them have taken a blade. Uh, many of them have taken an injection. Many of them have taken a pill. Many of them have swerved off the road, uh, jumped off a bridge, uh, or done some other tragic thing to just take their own life. Uh, because the devil convinced them that they had no value, no self-worth. But I came to tell somebody, don't give up, don't fold your hands, don't quit, don't back up, don't throw in the towel, but stand up and let God arise and the enemy be scattered. And there's a third thing that I've seen people do. They become stronger as a result of the affliction. Some have become stronger as a result of the affliction that the enemy's brought into their life. Now some of you may have heard uh, I've heard this before. Some of you may have heard that when a bone is broken, when that bone is fully healed, it becomes stronger than before it was ever broken. What you have to understand about the broken bone, when the human body is operating in its natural function the way God created it to, suppose you go out on a bike ride 
Brother Roger, I think y'all ride bikes, don't you? Praise God. I thought I'd seen that on your Facebook the other day. And you're like one of the preachers that I know, riding his bike with another friend of his. Somehow their wheels got knocked and locked together, and it threw him over uh, the handles and fell on the ground and got broke up real bad. But suppose a, bro a bone gets broken. When they try to reset that bone if it's out of, out of place, there's a gap between the two broken pieces. Calcium begins to fill in the place where the gap is. The bone begins to swell where it's broken. But the more it swells and the more calcium begins to add the deposits around it, now that spot of the bone is actually stronger than it was before it ever got broken. Now, I can't say much for the other part of the bone, but if you want to re-break that bone where it was broke before, you're going to have to try real hard because that bone gets stronger. And I began to pray and talk to the Lord about this message. And I know there's some folks, all of us have probably been in that place where we thought low of ourselves. We felt that we were weaker than we really are. Some of you that say, I'm not strong enough to get through this. God, why did you allow this in my life? Why? I'm not strong enough. I'm not really where I need to be right now. And some of you think you're not strong enough. Let me ask you, how much have you already been through and made it? Come on, how much has God already brought you through? How much has the mercy of God already kept you? Come on and say amen. Some of you, if you went through what you're going through right now, five years ago, 13 years ago, 14, 45 years ago, some of you would have given up and said, I quit. Ain't no need to serve God. What are you trying to tell me, Pastor? I'm trying to show you that you're stronger than you realize. You've gained some strength. And you need to lean on the Lord and not on your own understanding this morning because you are strong in the Lord and in the power of not your might but in his might. Can you say amen? Power, power over the enemy. Somebody say amen this morning. I realize that a lot of times we feel that way about ourselves but here we read in the word of God the psalmist even said in 119 and 71. This is the psalmist in a dreary, dreadful, difficult place of his life. And he makes this statement. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn the statutes. Can I ask you a question? Is there anybody here, you've ever been just sitting around one day and you said, Lord, I'm glad you afflicted me. Now, maybe there might be one or two, I don't know. But for the rest of us, I don't know that I've ever said, oh, I'm so glad I got sick. But subconsciously, I realize that there are some things that turned, about, turned out to be the greatest blessing for us. We didn't see it like that at the time. Some of you have heard my testimony, and I don't say this to be humorous, but I, I dated several Christies before I found the right Christie. And they all had their names spelled differently. But I finally got the right one, and there's a part of me, I thank God, that I didn't settle for the wrong one before I found the right one. What I'm trying to show somebody here this morning is you're going through it, you've been through it, or you might be about to go through something, and you're going to need this message to sustain you because you're going to ride that emotional roller coaster where the enemy gets in the ear and he begins to whisper to you, it's over. I don't know why I'm feeling this, but somebody, somebody, whether you're here or listening online, he's been telling you, it's over. It's over. As the Israelite people begin to be afflicted, hell has assailed against them in every way possible. They're trying to get their kids killed. They're trying to kill them out on the field with hard labor, strenuous, unbelievable, heat stroke labor. They realize what the devil's trying to do. Let me tell you, sometimes we go through things and it takes us three quarters of the trial to realize where the real problem is. 
recently. I went through an ordeal. And oh, I was all torn up, shook up, messed up. One morning I got up and I began to get ready for the day and the Spirit of God began to stir my heart and Sister Misty, the Lord, spoke to me and said, it's a Spirit. Now when God gives you a revelation, you can tell 15 other people and they'll look at you with a blank stare. Nobody looked at me that way, by the way. You can tell 15 other people and they're looking at you. Why? Because that revelation was not meant for them. It was meant for you. And God said, it's a spirit. Sometimes even the preacher has to be reminded that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness in high places. Sometimes even the preacher needs God to speak to him and say, get your, get your head out of the sand, son. See this for what it's worth. You've gone through half the trial, three quarters of the trial, beat down, broken, messed up, and you finally be, it finally dawns on you who the real culprit is behind all of this. It's the king, Pastor Myers. It's the king. It's that new king. Yeah. He was used like an administrator. He was used as a conduit for the powers of hell to work through. God stepped back and God allowed it for a little while. Why? You see, in their affliction, they began to cry out to God. They began to cry and say, Oh, God, deliver us from this pain. The reason why that sometimes God allows these things to come into our life is simply because you were too comfortable with kind of serving God. Oh, God. You got too comfortable with just kind of, sort of being faithful. Kind of, sort of loving God. Kind of, sort of being in it. And God said, if this right here does not drive you to cry out to me, what will? When I look at the Word of God, I can see where the three Hebrew boys were afflicted. But when it was over with, they came out as princes over the providence. Job got afflicted and lost everything he had, but when it was over with Sister Jackson, he came out with more than he started with. Joseph, the one with the coat of many colors, was afflicted by his own people, his own brothers, his own blood those that were supposed to be closest to him. The enemy used his own family as a channel to get to him. But when it was all over with the very people that stood as an, as an advocate, I guess you'd say, for the enemy's side, not God's side, were the very people, the very family that one day bowed down before him. That's the other side of affliction. Come here, Sister Myers. I want everyone that is here to understand the reality that when you look at a pillar of power in the church, when you look at somebody who has resilience and you look at somebody with strength and somebody with a faith walk, they didn't get there. They didn't get there without affliction. The more He afflicted them, the more they grew. That is the reason why that when that scar tissue begins to build up, it gets thicker and harder to break through. That is the reason why that if you want to gain muscle, they tell you to go lift weights. Why, Pastor Myers? Because when a man lifts weights or a woman lifts weights, guess what happens to them? Their muscles begin, the little fibers of the muscles, they rip during the process of working out. When you work hard, those Israelite people, while they were building up walls and building cities and all of that, their muscle fibers were ripping in their arms and their legs and their hands and their feet 
fingers and everywhere else. And the more that those fibers ripped in the remolding process, those muscles grow back stronger. And you want to know how? That you're going to have a strong marriage? Anybody want to know how you're going to have a strong marriage? You may have to be afflicted by the enemy so that you can grow stronger. You want to have a closer relationship between you and your children? Sometimes there's got to be some affliction between the whole family. Amen. It's not always easy peasy. Sometimes uh, the makeup is worse than, come on, it's better than the breakup. Sometimes God uses what you went through to elevate you to the next place. But God said before that I can promote you. I've got to take you through a process uh, before I can bless you. You've got to be blistered uh, before I can help you. You've got to go through hellfire. You've got to face the hot heat and the flames uh, because the more you're afflicted, uh, the more you'll abound. Uh, but there's only one way that'll be true for your testimony. It's when you lay back in the arms of the potter and you yield to the process uh, and you say, Lord, uh, yea, though you slay me, yet will I trust you. I don't understand it. It don't make a lot of sense. I've been through hell and back past the hours. Uh, the enemy's fought my mind. He's fought me from the time I rise. Uh, sometimes he even fights me in my sleep. Uh, but thanks be to God uh, who gives us the victory. He is the one that owns it all. He's the one in control of it all. And if I'll just give him the reins, God will say to the church, to the child of God, give me the reins. Step back and watch me work. Step back and watch how that I move. The enemy's whispered in your ear and told you it's over, but God said your exodus Woo! Hallelujah! God said it's over. Uh, the enemy told you it's over but the enemy is telling you that but God said this is your exodus uh, This your exodus is on the way uh, how many knows what exodus sounds a whole lot like sounds a whole lot like exit like get out of here like get out uh, this ain't monopoly honey pass go and get $200 uh, God said I'm going to open up a door and let you out uh, I'm going to open up a door and you're going to come out from where you were uh, you got comfortable with being a slave uh, you got comfortable with just kind of a little bit of freedom and still being a slave uh, but God said what my real desire is uh, I want to give you real deliverance uh, I want you to have the land of free flowing milk and honey I want you to have your own Canaan land. I didn't create you to be in bondage. I didn't create you to be a slave. I created you to be a domineering power that is to be reckoned with with hell. Somebody lift your hand and give God praise. Oh, hallelujah. We just stand all across the house of the Lord this morning. My God, I feel the presence of the holy God of heaven here this morning. There are some of you, you're already going through it. Some of you are on the tail end of it. Some of you are about to walk through your place of affliction. You don't understand what you've been going through. None of it makes really any sense. Some of you got caught by surprise. But God wants you to understand that it did not catch him by Surprise this morning. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed right now. I just want to give you a very, very general altar call for every 